I'm Robert DeLutis. I'm the uh, climate professor at the University of Maryland, and I've been there about six years. The um, great part of that job is that you do have time to play in orchestras as well, so I'm also the principal clarinet of the Annapolis Symphony Orchestra in the capital of Maryland. So, I think my first clarinet uh, com conference was in 1979, and I was a, a very young student, and I was in the um, high school competition. I think I was uh, 13 years old. So I've come to about 40 years of these, nice. so many years. Yeah. What's your philosophy with regards to the equipment you play, whether it is clarinet or mm -hmm. mouthpieces or reeds? Yeah, I think that the equipment is essential, especially for a beginner, that it works at its best. I think the number one reason students stop playing the instrument is they're having difficulty producing a sound easily, or the reed's not working, or the instrument's leaking, or there's problems with the function. And then as you progress to the next level, um, you start to look for instruments and equipment that helps you produce the type of sound you're trying to achieve. So once you've developed a concept of tone and you play on the instrument, you're looking for one that quickly helps you match that. Some instruments take you in a totally different direction. Some mouthpieces will take you in a different way. But the one for me that has the most focused sound, that produces a, an easy voice for yourself, is what I'm looking for. How <clears throat> easy or how difficult is it to identify that? Because you know this for yourself. Yeah. You have the feelings for right, yourself. Right. And you have clearly identified it for yourself. How do you work this out with the student? Yeah. Well, we spend lots of time. Every lesson begins with a warm-up, a very slow warm-up, where we talk about tone quality. And we do long tones, slow warm-up. And then we listen. We listen to recordings in the lesson. We'll stop. We'll play some recordings of people we think we should be emulating. I may demonstrate. Uh, if your teacher is demonstrating for you, that's a plus. Hopefully, they are. I know that there are teachers in the past that have not played in lessons. Um, but if you're not going to play in a lesson, you at least need to show the student in a recording and develop a list of recordings for the student. That these are the ones that you and I can agree we think we are trying to achieve together. And we have a narrow path because there is a lot of variety. And to have a cohesive studio, especially when you play in a clarinet ensemble, quartet, you have a certain type of tone that will blend the most when we're all on the same page with, this, with the tone quality. Um, it's the same when you play with a piano. A piano has certain types of articulations, certain qualities that it can do. And when you play with it, as a, as a chamber musician, you need to match those qualities as a clarinetist. The pianist cannot do what we can do. And so the more you're able to voice the instrument like them, and the more they're able to play like a wind player, the better and more cohesive the sound will be of the ensemble. So, For jazz players, their goal is probably to be able to be recognized as soon as possible. <laughs> In a few seconds they play. Yeah, yeah. For the classical players, it's a more homogeneous school. Yeah. What is your view on, on, on this? I think in the end, the great artists are the ones when you hear them play you don't know it's them the great artists are the ones you hear mozart when they play mozart you hear brahms you feel the passion of schumann you don't say that's this person playing that's that person playing that's that jazz artist you say that's a great coltrane tune or that's a great tune by whoever it is you like so i think that, that is the hardest thing uh, to, as an artist because that, lets you, that forces you to get rid of your ego and to become a true artist who has no ego and is expressing this joy and passion of the composer. That's our job. Serve, serving the music. Yeah. Hard to believe it, but that's what it is. Yes, <laughs> yes. So what's your story with uh, Selmer Paris, new generation of... of Mouthpieces. First, did, have you played before some summer well, yeah. mouthpieces? I, when I first started to play the clarinet, I played a summer HS star. 
So that was Henry my Henry Selmer. Henry Selmer. Yeah. So that was my first introduction. My father brought me home a clarinet, and it had a HS Star mouthpiece in it, and I played it for two or three years, and then I dropped it, and I chipped a little corner off of it. I was young. That happens. And so I think we just we went to the store and got something else. We didn't really know. Turned out years later, I found out that my teacher, David Weber, had played on the same mouthpiece for a long time. He played the Selmer mouthpiece. So um, I was surprised when I saw the new mouthpiece had come out, and it was, um, it was, it was nice looking, for starters. But then when I tried it, immediately I recognized that quality, maybe from when I was a kid. There's a, there's a nice, easy focus to the mouthpiece. There's many improvements, though. It, it plays more in tune. It's got, for me, it has a, um, a wider, it has a slightly wider facing, so it's bigger, a bigger sound. Immediately, it had a nice um, mellowness to the tone, so that was all part of what I was looking for. I make my own reeds, so I'm looking for something that will play my reed. I use a reed that has a very um, flexible tip and a high heart, so the heart of the reed supports your lips, but then the, the reed is vibrate, vibrant enough to let the air through the mouthpiece and to really make the resonance you're looking for. So, so From the moment you, you try for the first time the yeah. mouthpiece and you have a good feeling about it, what is the process to, to go further in, in the mm -hmm. trial and then to really accept it so that it becomes your main yeah, mouthpiece? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I make pretty quick decisions. So as soon as I played it, I recognized a very, a very nice focus in the, that it added to the sound, the, the focus you're trying to get when it does it instantly for you or with you, sort of a joint effort. Um, and then I check with the tuner to make sure that I'm not hearing something like maybe it's too flat and that's making me think it's very dark and mellow or maybe it's sharp and it's too bright. So I immediately try with a tuner tried all my reeds with it and they all seem to work because some mouthpieces you'd be surprised can only play one reed. I picked a mouthpiece a few years ago and it, um, it's a great mouthpiece but it only played on one reed, the one I tried it on. I threw it, I got rid of it right away. <laughs> so no, this mouthpiece was very reed friendly I call it, which is important that when you, especially when you're going to play a commercial reed, that the strength of the reed will fit the mouthpiece that you're not having to play a, a, a reed that's three and three quarters and, a, and plus a little extra. So, or you're having to sand all your reeds to fit the mouthpiece, at least for the lip strength. The air, the air flow is something you almost always have to adjust slightly because reeds have such a variety. But this mouthpiece has the, the, air, the air resistance I'm looking for and the, the hold on the, the heart in the reed. Did you have to try many mouthpieces to find the one and the backup one? Do you mm -hmm. have some comments on the, on the consistency yeah. of the mouthpiece? I tried the first mouthpiece, and that's the one I'm still playing on, and then I've tried 10, 20 more, and um, I picked the backup one. They were very consistent. There wasn't, it wasn't hard to find uh, six mouthpieces that I didn't want to give up, but I've let people try them and I have given up on some, but mainly I would recommend most people have their main mouthpiece and their backup and commit to it. I mean, that, like you were asking before, is it, I tried it and I decided I like this. I also like my old mouthpiece, it was one of my own personal mouthpieces, but I decided I like this and I'm going to try it for six months. I'm not going to play both or have three different kinds. I'm going to commit to this for six months. And so while I was in that, I recorded the Mozart Quintet on it. I recorded Weber Quintet, Francais Concerto on it, um, Glazunov Oriental Reverie, um, Behrman Adagio on it. Lots of unaccompanied, made a bunch of CDs with this mouthpiece already, and it's proven to be great, so. What's the experience of the studio? with the mouthpiece. Some of your students yeah. play the mouthpiece. Mm -hmm. How did that work? Because we know it's something personal. Yeah. The cliche about the, 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 the professor who's advising one equipment and yeah. then the whole studio plays the same thing. Right. What, what do you think? How, how, how did, what was the process yeah. and the acceptance in your, in your studio? Well, I have in the studio mouthpieces of all types for them to try. 
so I, tr I let them try it. I only change equipment with students if it feels like they're having trouble with tone production, that it doesn't seem to fit them right, or if they're having lots of read issues. No matter what they do, they can't seem to find a read that fits the mouthpiece. So we try to take the reads that they are using and what they've done and find a mouthpiece that fits them. Several of the students tried the summer mouthpiece and immediately gravitated towards the, the concept. Some gravitated towards the other model, the Focus. And, um, but many gravitated towards the concept. But I don't force them to, to play it. I let them choose. And some couldn't play it, but the ones that could sound great on it. So. I think it's very personal, so we, we, um, we try to stay flexible though, I think. You should always be trying equipment some, so that you don't become stuck in a comfort zone with what you have, because that equipment will change over time, and then when you do have to replace it, what happens is it seems so foreign to you. You have a mouthpiece that has 20 years of playing on it, maybe the facing has twisted or warped or just rounded off. And so I do the same with my instrument. I look for a new one every two to three years to try to stay with the program. You don't want to become stuck.